Hey everybody, I'm going to pass it on to Laura and feel free to introduce yourselves. Hi everyone, welcome to the stream. My name is Laura. I'm the chapter lead for Code Academy Seoul and I'm here with Fede, who is the community manager for Code Academy. Our guest today is Dr. Katharina Groger, or Dr. Kat for short. Dr. Kat graduated with a PhD in chemistry from the Humboldt University of Berlin in 2018. And she started working for BASF a year prior. Since then, Dr. Kat has gained a wealth of experience as a manager, some of which she would like to share with us today. Welcome Dr. Kat, and thanks for joining. Over to you. Yeah. Thank both of you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Laura. And also thanks for the opportunity to share my expertise with you in this, in this round. I'm diving in from Berlin, Germany right now. And before I also jump into the topic, I also comment a little bit about why I'm so interested to talk about this, uh, this topic and why is it so, so close to my heart. So the topic about what do employers look for in a data scientist or also in a data engineer. So I also prepared some slides. So I start sharing the screen so that we can follow also the logic of the talk together. So I hope you can see my screen now. Maybe also as a brief introduction um, about myself. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, as already introduced, I'm located here in Berlin, Germany. And actually I did my thesis and, and also my studies in the area of chemistry, uh, more specific bioorganic chemistry, which does not sound like the easiest topic to now go to data science, but I come to it in a minute, why data science data engineering is so interesting to me. Um, with my background in chemistry, I joined BSF as one of the biggest chemical companies in the world directly after my studies. And within my time with BSF, I changed a couple of positions. So while starting in data management for chemical data, I then switched to, as Laura just mentioned, to the role of becoming also hiring manager for other profiles than just the chemical profile. So starting with data management, I was also working um, as disciplinary leader for topics or for profiles in the area of data science, data engineering, but also developers. And during this time, I, I really enjoy um, working with, with data scientists, data engineers, but some experiences during the interviews made me think, whether it wouldn't be valuable to share some thoughts and some experiences that I gained with especially young people who want to enter this area. And this is why this um, occasion and this talk is so close to my heart, because this is the option and the opportunity to do so. So uh, what's the talk about? I switch to the next and what is not about. So I see this as an opportunity to share my experiences. So I will also talk as me as a private person. So even though I made a lot of experience in the job context with BSF, I'm not here to speak as a representative of the company. I'm here as a private person to share my experience. And three steps or three stages are relevant here. So ideas you should have and, and thoughts you should make before the job interview, the job interview itself, and also what's important in this area when you are in your work environment. So the title says, what do employers look for a data scientist? But also, as I said and mentioned, um, my experience is not only based on data science, but also data engineering development. So this is more like a broad term for all this kind of IT and data related profiles. However, I'm more focusing on junior positions. So I hope this is also something which um, you as an audience are, are more interested in. It also just um, comes with with the simple fact that I'm more hiring in the junior profile area. And also questions are highly welcome. We'll have a Q&A section at the end, but also um, Laura, Fede, feel free to jump in and ask questions if you, if you feel like it. Also to clarify what it's not about. Um, I will not talk about prioritizing any kind of specific languages or coding skills. This is very individual for every employer and every position. Um, if you want to really make sure that the position you apply for is covering or is in alignment with your skill set, read the job offers or call the recruiting team and ask them. So I will not do prioritization here. Also, I will not comment on CVs. CVs are very regional specific. 
So any piece of advice I would give here might be wrong for your certain area. And last but not least, this is also no job promo. It's an exchange. So I'm here to share experience, not to promote certain positions. And with this being said, let's then jump into the first piece here, what to look at before you apply the position. Mm. So well, Kat, sorry, uh, just, to, just to really um, jump in really quickly because you put your um, LinkedIn plug in there. So um, just to double check, what, what are your boundaries? Can people add you? Can people follow you? Can people get in touch um, about certain positions or applications? Like what's, what are your boundaries here? Sure. Um, so I shared also the, the, the LinkedIn name so that you can also find me. Um, mm -hmm. please feel free to, to reach out to me by a message um, for, for, for all kinds of different topics if you're interested to mm -hmm. learn more. Um, and I think LinkedIn would be the best way to, to reach out to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Now let's imagine you're there, you, you did some studies in data science, data engineering, you, um, or you come from a different field and you enrich your knowledge by, by doing um, some, some, some coding trainings. And you're there thinking what, what to do with your knowledge now. And one important thing, and this is pretty general for all positions, but here specifically, um, you need to be clear for yourself what you are expecting from your job. There will never ever be the one job that covers every, every, everything. So when you select for positions, you need, first of all, to think what is really important for yourself. Is it the salary, which is on prior number one, which is, which is just perfectly fine? Um, is it your development chances that really matter to you? Is it important to you that your job offers you the, the opportunity to learn new techniques, new tools? How important is the location? Um, is it very interesting to you in which industry you are in? Or actually, does the industry not matter and it's more about the content, what you do? Or how much do you want to identify with the purpose of the company or, or, or the task? All those questions you should ask yourself beforehand, because this is very important to be at the end happy in your, in your role that you take. And when you rank those parameters for yourselves, you will also already answer a lot of questions like, is it a big company you should join or is it more a startup? They are very different in, in their mechanisms. Um, for instance, if you want to have development chances within a company, you should go for a big company where there's a lot of opportunities there to change within one company. If it's more important to you to have more freedom within the task that you that you want to that you want to do maybe start up with flatter hierarchies is more suitable for you and one aspect i want to advertise for here do project as much as you can um, because projects give you then the opportunity to understand more about yourself what kind of environment fits to you another aspect um, which you should consider before applying to a position is your personal stage of experience where you're at. So when you're pretty young to the, to the area of data science, data engineering, um, I would recommend to look rather for teams that are already more established, where you have maybe a senior data scientist who can teach you things where routines are in place um, so where the team is already running smoothly and you don't have to take care of such things and can really focus on doing your job and learning within your job. If you're more experienced, you can, or, yeah, you can also join um, younger teams which are more in the build-up phase because those teams will also offer you more opportunities to develop faster into, let's say, leadership positions, for instance. If you're building up new teams, there's permanent growth and the demand for leaders. Right, so this is something where you should figure out at which stage are you and what fits for you. And again, specifically if you're more in the first part, so in the less experienced section, I again advocate for do projects. So what I mean by, by project, this can be literally anything which translates a real life problem into a coding or, or data science evaluation task. So projects do not only 
help you to train your skills. It also teaches you a lot about your own strengths and weaknesses. It helps you to, to learn this translation step from like the problem to what needs to be done. And also helps you to zoom between those different levels. So being able to speak about the high level purpose of the project, as well about the deep dive, uh, how did you finally solve it? So you learn also a lot of organizational aspects and how teamwork works when you want to get something done, which is bigger than a one man show. Okay, so at this point, I think um, I made the point how, how important I think projects are when you're entering the job search. And now let's say you found some, some jobs, you, you reflected on yourself and you got invited to the interview. So first of all, the interview is a dialogue. Um, sometimes people come to the interview and think they, they are expected to be brilliant at everything. Um, we're fully aware that people are people, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And the interview is a dialogue where we can see whether our expectations meet. So whether what we offer is what you expected and what you can offer fits to the job role we have. So one thing I want to raise awareness for is people that you meet in the interview do not necessarily always need to be technically first and knowledgeable people. Take me, for example. <laughs> I came from a, from a completely different area uh, and I'm also responsible to evaluate how you fit into our team or whether it works out. So you should be aware of the fact that you do not only need to convince by your hard skills, but you also need to convince people like me who rather want to understand what is the benefit of what you did? Did you really translate this, this bigger problem into, into the smaller pieces and find the solutions? And here again, what's really helpful, the examples and the projects. If you can tell about a story where you accomplished something based on a bigger problem, that's very valuable to really understand how you think and how you translate those, those issues. And also here, it's very important, as said on the slide before, to be able to translate between the high level idea and the deep dive. How did you do it? And, and um, how did you solve the issues on this way? Um, sorry, sorry to butt in again, um, but can I just ask you, so do you have any sort of cases, any sort of stories without giving away personal information or any private information? Um, did you ever have someone come in for an interview and they talked about a project that really impressed you? A project that really impressed me. So mm. um, I, I cannot give a specific one because um, actually every interview covers at least give me one example. And there are a lot of nice examples. What mostly what, what I mostly enjoy to listen to are stories where people developed something on their own without having um, a fixed framework. So I also enjoy listening to, I did in my master's thesis or I had an internship here, but I really enjoy those uh, examples where, where people come up with a problem they're observed on their own. For instance, they, are, they have a hobby in a certain field and uh, they realize this would be much better if I would be able to um, to have more data in this and figure out certain certain aspects and then they just do something because it's valuable to them. Um, and why do I enjoy those uh, examples most? Because this has all the pieces of bringing a business case into a real solution. Yeah, it's it's it shows me that you don't need to have like a, a pre-described problem where everything is, is, is already described in detail, but you can understand a real life problem and you just are also motivated on your own to find your solutions. So those, those tasks or those examples where someone translates something from a personal world and just looks for solutions, that's very inspiring and I enjoy it a lot. Yeah, and when we're in the interview, of course, besides uh, non-techie people like myself, of course, mostly there's also someone who can evaluate the tech side. 
there are companies who, who use those kind of, of test mechanisms beforehand. Um, for us, it's, it's more use or we use it more widely to really have the interview with a tech person, because as we all know, there are more than one way to, to solve a problem. And this is something you can figure out better in, in, in an interview with tech guys. And here, um, one, one thing which is important, be, be honest and be, be, be open. Um, sometimes people are so, so afraid not to make it through the interview that they start to try to oversell themselves and are not very honest about how much they did on their own. I don't say that it's the majority, for sure not. But just to let you know, we see this. <laughs> and even, even if I'm not the tech person, mostly even I see this when it becomes a little bit blurry and when people start to, to, to be hesitant about describing what they did. So be honest and say, okay, I'm not so uh, knowledgeable in this part, but I solve my problems using maybe the other language, using another tool. That's totally fine to say. It's better to be clear about what you can do and what you cannot. And also companies are very, very open in giving you trainings. So the typical example is um, when cloud experience is important. Um, it mostly doesn't matter whether it's Azure or AWS. Um, if you work in the cloud environment, that's fine. And if you need one of the other tools, we'll train you, no, no worries. But it's more important to be honest and open about what you can do and leave the impression of you being an honest person than trying to, to, um, to pretend there is something which isn't there. Um, how does it normally work? Do you have someone who is a non-technical person plus a tech person at the same time? Or do you have them sort of at different internal intervals? It depends. Uh, it really depends mm. on um, how the team is set up. We have uh, we, we had already both cases. So um, sometimes it's the tech person and, and, and myself. And then I mostly leave, first of all, the stage to the tech colleague, because this is more the discussion that, that needs to be also um, have the room and the, the freedom to go into depth. Uh, and then I add my questions, which are more team and, and, and soft skill correlated. But there are also other cases where, um, for example, the tech colleagues also develop a challenge, um, send the challenge prior to the interview so that the applicant has some time to work on it. And then after, let's say, an hour, the interview takes place and you can discuss the result. What I really like about this approach is that the applicant also sees what are our problems because we developed the challenge. And also it's not just um, you hand in some code and then it's either right or wrong, but you as an applicant also have the chance to describe why you chose this way. Why did you um, select the, why, why did you do it the way you did it? And I think that's, that's nice if you have this dialogue here. Yeah, and last but not least, you being there in the interview, um, be clear and honest, as I already said. So um, tell us clearly what you bring to the table. Of course, an interview is also about selling yourself. So we be proud of what you did. Um, give us examples. Um, uh, give us examples also where you struggled to achieve something, but achieved it at the end. Um, and also tell us what's important to you. Um, as I said, there won't be the one position which is covering every, every, everything. But if your expectations and what we can offer come close together, then it's a good fit. Okay, and now let's look at the third stage. So you managed to go through the interview, we got to know each other, and now we think, yeah, that, that will work out. And um, you're a, a part of our team. Then, of course, the dialogue continues. And I want to... Um, have a brief reflection on, on two different aspects, the one being the, the feedback culture and the other being the work culture. Um, so feedback culture is something which is, um, uh, I, I don't know whether there are companies who would not value uh, a good feedback culture. And feedback always means feedback in both directions. 
Um, and for us specifically, we have at least twice a year a dialogue between the manager and the employee, where we also reflect on the personal strengths and weaknesses and where you can also address your, yeah, your perception of, of your tasks and uh, what fits better to you and where you would like to have some, some, some more support. And this is important in order to also shape your development path, right? Um, uh, you, you can be interested in, in digging deeper into, into problems and learning more different tools, different languages, which is more an expert path. Or on the other hand side, you can also be more generalistic um, in, in, in your yeah, skill set and be also more interested in um, leading things. So this is a complete different development path. And this is something we can just also do, figure out in the dialogue and with giving you feedback on how we perceive you in your job role. And also, um, please address any kind of improvements and suggestions that you have in, in, in the workplace. So one important piece is, is trainings. You know best what kind of trainings you would need to do your job better. So you need to address this to your manager and say, hey, I can solve those tasks, but actually I would be also interested to learn this kind of tool sets because I think I could do the task even better. And you're, you're, we're happy to hear this and you will get those trainings. And also another part where you can always give feedback is also the kind of job organization. So how is the task distribution within the team? Those are always regular discussions that you should have with your manager so that we're aware of what you need and you are aware of what, what we think of, of, of your performance so far. And um, the second part of the slide, the, the work culture, that's, that's something pretty generic. So I will just briefly briefly touch on those four pieces but this is basically how how this things work together you you have always an organizational component which is um, very dependent on the company you're working for there's the cultural component which is correlated to the values of the company um, there's always the team perspective and your individual role within the team so when you're looking also for jobs this is something you can also reflect on beforehand um, look at the company you're applying to, what are the values, how, do, how is the structure, um, are you a big fan of, of flat hierarchies or are you okay with a more hierarchical structure? This is something which will be important for your day-to-day -day life. So to give you an example here, big companies mostly have very or more complicated processes. So in order to, to change something, something big, you will have to to get through a lot of process steps in a big company, right? So that, that's just something you have to be aware of. And if you say that's um, that's stressing to you, maybe a smaller company or startup would be more suitable for you. Work culture, as I said, that's part of, 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 of the values that a company has. And this should also ideally be something you can identify with. Uh, if you don't identify with the path and the strategy a company goes on the long-term run, this can be also stressful. Um, team setup, this can be very, very different. And you should also reflect for yourself um, where you feel comfortable. So is it, for instance, uh, that you want to be part of mixed teams? So where you have a lot of different profiles and you learn a lot from different people, but where you also have to be very good at your job and explain it to others? Or would you rather prefer to be a data engineer among data engineers where you are where you have an easier living in, in uh, exchanging on, on, on job specifics, but you will not get so much from the outside perspective. That's very individual and um, that's something you need to reflect on. And the other points, team fit. So how do you communicate with your team colleagues? Does it feel comfortable, natural? Work management, um, most uh, jobs in the area of development, engineering are working in an agile work mode. But there will be, of course, also um, uh, teams which are not structured in that way. So you need also to see how this whole work mode fits with you. And last but not least, um, always reflect on your hard skills, ask for trainings if you need some, um, and also reflect on your soft skills. So if you find yourself in a role where ex communication is expected and you're uncomfortable with that, that's not the best situation. So again, here you should 
talk to your manager, whether it's um, whether it's some kind of training that can help you or whether there is also a more back-end role that you could fit in. And with this being said, we're already, already at the summary. So in the beginning, think about what's important for yourself. Articulate this clearly in the interview. What are your strengths? What do you bring to the table? What are you expecting? And then continue the dialogue with your team and your manager. So back to you, Laura. All right, um, let's have a look at, um, okay. Uh, let me see if there's anyone who has questions. Um, I think maybe people are still thinking about questions. So maybe I'll just bump in and get my questions in first. Um, so uh, what I wanted to ask you, so you having a sort of very academic sort of research background, right? Um, was there anything that surprised you or anything that took you back when you started hiring? Anything surprising? Um, is mm. it, yeah, actually, so um, I'm thinking now of an example um, when hiring specifically for data analytics and data visualization positions. I was surprised to see how many people apply coming from a different field. And this mm. was not only fields like I'm used to natural science, um, where you have also uh, a clear connect to data, but also very, very different other fields from psychology, social science, uh, languages. Um, and on, on the one hand side, I think that's that's a very good trend. Um, mm. As we see, digitalization is, is a big part in, in all kinds of different business functions. So I think in the future, we will need more and more people who are able to think cross-functionally. So who combine this kind of specific business knowledge, supply chain, finance, whatever, mm. with expertise, how to work with data, how to design the tools. Um, I think this mm. is a very good trend. On the other hand side, um, why I was also so surprised is this transformation process from, from one profile to to data science, data analytics is not easy. And I saw a lot of people who had one or two certificates, um, mm. entry level of whatever, mm -hmm. and then they expected to have this full-time position, which is just focusing on data. And this mm. is unfortunately mostly not how it works. Um, mm. So you need to be aware that this transformation process is challenging. And I know this is again, this kind of like hand and neck problem where people expect you to have experience, but nobody gives you a job to gain experience. So this is where I come again, back to the point of the projects, you know, mm. do those certificates and then do the projects. And when you are in the interview, I see in your CV, okay, you did this kind of project and we can talk about it. And then you can tell us um, what did you do there? Why did you come up with this idea? And you are much closer to the real job if you already had some kind of project where you had to translate this real life problems into a technical solution and your chances are much higher to be invited to the interview. Right. Um, just looking at the questions. So somebody's asking, um, does it matter if you have school training or if you're self taught I think that you just kind of answered that. So um, if you have those projects, if you can sort of have that, that, you know, other things to back you up. Yeah. Um, like you say, you know, you, you don't have to be data science major all the way. Is that, is that correct? Exactly, exactly. So yeah. um, let me also um, give you here an example, uh, specifically from, from natural scientists. Um, I, I see this quite frequently. If you mm. come from a background in physics, um, where you had maybe some kind of um, molecular physics, where you also use programming and coding languages, and then you use this to jump more into this kind of coding profile and you started to do your own projects and coding, et cetera. I totally see why you want to have a job in this field, regardless of the fact that your CV says, I'm a master of physics. Mm, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, somebody's asking the steps to learn data science. Um, I feel like that's, that's kind of a big question. Uh, it, it, it is, um, and it really oh. depends a bit, a bit on your individual um, uh, case where you're coming from. So as I said, oh. there, are, there are some 
uh, some education paths, some careers where you have already the contact with data and um, you will maybe not need to have this certificate based uh -huh. um, trainings, but you more or less jump into this. Um, if, you, if you're coming from, from a completely different field, I think coming, st starting with, um, uh, yeah, like, like Codecademy or Udemy or whatever they're called. So with starting with a platform yeah. that helps you is, is a good uh -huh. beginning. It's, it's really a good start because here you can, first of all, learn a couple of things, understand what this whole topic is about and just step-by-step step, um, enrich your, your training. Mm. And then some people are asking about sort of hard skills and projects. I think you kind of answered that earlier where you said um, what you like to see is sort of like a, like a passion project, like a sort of pet project, and then sort of apply your skills to it. Um, okay. Um, okay. So maybe, maybe also to comment on, on hard skills. So um, mm. this, this, this now uh, goes a bit to the area of, of CVs, um, which... I want to say again as a disclaimer, it's there is no one size fits all, but uh -huh. what regularly and what's very helpful is when you have a summary of like the languages or the tools you used. Um, some people uh -huh. also like to, to, to rate themselves. So uh, like, like in an Amazon style from one to five, how many points would I give myself? Um, that's helpful for, for, a first, um, for a first impression. But then I would always look for what kind of tasks or project did you do where I can see mm. where you used Python? So if it says Python mm. 5 plus, then it would always look on your CV, where does it come from? Mm. Right. What drives you? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Mm. Okay. Right. Um, I feel like what you mentioned earlier, where you said that people are coming from different disciplines and they're sort of um, venturing into data and you say that you like that. I feel like that's very encouraging to a lot of people. Because um, yeah. it, it shows that even with a non-tech background, you can still do it. Okay. Um, all right. Important things that we can put on our resume to get callbacks. Um, I feel like you said earlier, you're not going to do resume feedback. Yeah. So is, is that right? Mm. Here, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant because I cannot speak mm. for managers of the world. And also here, um, the cultural aspect might be um, might be very very different, um, mm -hmm. but you will always have to have to be able to depict your hard skills. Whether it's now in mm -hmm. this, country, you have a list um, uh, where you rank yourself, but or, or whether you just put the projects. Um, the, the CV needs to be structured. So even mm -hmm. if I don't, I need to understand what you did and why this role might be interesting for you. Um, mm -hmm. Some people like to put their GitHub links. That's that's also nice. It shows mm -hmm. that you're involved in this community. Um, but those are now what, what I'm mentioning now. This is something which I personally do, and which I know some other managers also do. But I wouldn't mm -hmm. speak for everyone here. Right. Um, so actually, um, since so many people are asking about non-technical backgrounds, um, would you maybe be able to comment on your own non-tech background? Um, so you being um, very research focused, um, was it helpful or was it a hindrance at times? I mean, you still being in STEM though. Yeah, um, um, I, that, that's an interesting question. I, I, uh, I actually think that having a, a background in natural science was actually very helpful. Um, mm. I see a lot of parallels between natural sciences and uh, data science and, and all kind of data related fields. Um, mm -hmm. What those fields have in common is that you need again to have the, the understanding of a broad topic. So you need to understand mm -hmm. um, how does cancer work and why is it bad? And mm -hmm. you need to high level. A business, uh, a business issue, a business problem that needs to be solved. But at the same time, for both, you need to be able to translate this down to a very, very specific thing to do. So even though I understood cancer is bad, I need to mm. know a lot of experiments and how they work and how they are done properly. And I need to be able to do them properly in order to achieve some results. So that would be the chemical perspective. And when you work in, in the area of data, you kind of have mm. the same you first of all, and don't under, uh, underestimate that, you have to figure out where to find the data. 
and <laughs> actually, uh, statistics that's that's unfortunately true. 80% of the time of a data scientist are spent not by the actual data science, but looking for the data, doing the data cleansing and the data preparation. So you need to do, you need to be able to translate the business problem to where do I find the data? How do I prepare the data? And then comes the fancy part to generate the insights and translate them <laughs> back to the picture, right? You need to explain this then back to the business guys, why your insights are so valuable. So I think there are a lot of parallels. Yeah. Um, and as you said, I, I would totally encourage people who are interested in, in changing their role into a data related role to do this. I think there will be an even more growing market for, for this kind of profiles, but be aware that this is a transformation process and not just done by two or three certificates. Mm, yep. Um, was there anything that you wish you'd known beforehand before starting as a manager? Mm. That I wished I knew beforehand. Mm. Good question. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what I enjoy, um, but mm. I did, did not think would be so important is that you really need to be able to jump into new, new perspectives and new problems very, very fast. Um, and that, that also always implies that you need to leave behind your, your, your own ideas and pre-assumptions um, and take the other person's perspective to understand the, the way the other person thinks. Um, I, I hope this was kind of understandable. If it's too mm. blurry, also comment with example. No, I, I just feel like, um, yeah, no, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's all good. Okay, um, we're kind of at the wrap up stage. Let me just check any important questions. Um, how many projects do you think people should bring to the table? Like what's, what's a good number? Or is that kind of difficult to say? Oh, depending it's, on it's project depth. Mm. Difficult to say also because this mm. um, depends on the, the, the job role that you're applying to. So mm -hmm. as I said in the beginning, I'm now more focused on, on those entry level jobs um, where if you have a very interesting master thesis, thesis mm. that's already a good description. Um, mm. the, the, the higher the job position um, that, that, mm. that you're trying to go, the, the higher the expectations, of course. Okay. Um, we're kind of at the wrap up stage. Is there anything that you would like to sort of summarize? Anything you would like to say? Any parting parting remarks? Anything from Feder maybe? Uh, no, it was very informative. Um, you know, I keep seeing pa parallels between data science and web development. I talk to a lot of recruiters that work with uh, juniors in web development, and you know, the disciplines are different, but the principles sort of apply the same. Where they always say that you have to put an emphasis on building your own projects, be very confident in your own code. Uh, if you find the kind of interview where they send you a project to work on ahead of time, you know, spend as much time as you can in it, make sure that you that you take the time and, you know, do, don't wait until the last moment to work on it, of course, take it seriously. And also <laughs> be very honest during the interviews. All the recruiters always say, you know, um, to, you know, to give an example, if you're working with uh, React as a front-end framework, and you are not very confident with a certain part of the interviewer is asking you better to say, I don't know for sure and explain your reasoning. Because at the end of the day, what the interview, especially for a junior developer role, somebody that they understand is somebody that is growing into the role and developing into the career. Uh, they really want to know how you think and how you approach problems more than the actual technical hardcore knowledge. Because you can learn that on the job. You can learn that like week after week. So I know that I've seen a lot of parallels between what Dr. Cato is saying and, and our own recruiters saying, you know, we really want to see people at junior, uh, when they apply for junior roles, showing that and demonstrating that they can learn. That they're really, you know, eager to learn and that they're very passionate about the subject. Totally. So Laura, this, this was actually the summary. <laughs> I, I couldn't summarize it better. <laughs> um, Thanks for that. <laughs> willing yeah. to learn and, and, and show us that you're, that you're able to jump into new topics. And again, this is also something which is becoming more and more valuable in our, in our world today. 
um, whatever you learned yesterday might be obsolete tomorrow. So it's way more important that you are curious to jump into those new topics and that you're eager to learn. Okay, so we are uh, done for today, I think, Laura, is that correct? All right, well, thank you everybody for stopping by. Uh, it's been, you know, I've had a, a good time listening to Dr. Kat. There's always something to learn, always a new perspective to learn uh, when you're applying for jobs and when you're trying to learn, you know, interviews and the whole intricacies. I think a good point was saying that every company is a little different. So be mindful of where you're applying, your country, your culture, your background. There's always a lot of details that go into this and you have to be persistent. Always apply and sometimes people get it at the first try. Sometimes you have to apply for a hundred different roles. Just be consistent and be persistent. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you in our next live stream. Have a good weekend. Thank you. And that's it. <clears throat>